Hi Gators and welcome back to my channel. So today I am here in person to discuss a very delicate case and it was actually one that was suggested to me via email by one of you. It is the case of Peggy Knobloch, a child that disappeared in 2001, so quite a long time ago now and the case is sadly still unsolved. It is one of the bigger German cases that is still unsolved and a lot has been written in German but I couldn't find much in English so I thought this would be a great case to cover and bring to you so you also hear about it. And without much further ado, let me know if you like this format or not um, at the end of the video and let's get into the case. Today's case takes us to Lichtenberg which is a town in Germany's Bavaria. Perhaps to give you an idea of its size, as of December 31st, 2020, the town had some 1,000 citizens. So it is definitely on the smaller side, but nonetheless an interesting place. Lichtenberg lies on a hill above the valley of the river Selbitz in the Frankenwald Nature Park, which is absolutely stunning. I love a good nature park. The town's origins date back to the 9th century and not long after, the Dukes of Meranien occupied the town. Soon, new buildings were introduced and existing buildings were remodeled, leading to the town's expansion in the 12th century. That is also when the town's only fortress was built, which has since been destroyed and rebuilt twice. Each September, the castle holds a medieval-themed festival for its citizens. And if you've never been to one of those, you should, they're good fun. So Peggy, who was affectionately called Schnecke, which means slug in English, I know, I know, but it's a term of endearment in German, I swear. She was born on April the 6th, 1992 in Bayreuth, to Susanne Knobloch, who herself was only 19 at the time of Peggy's birth. Despite the pregnancy not having been planned, Susanne was thrilled to find out she was with child and decided to have the baby. This new baby was an opportunity for her to have the family she had always dreamt of. Susanne's own parents divorced in 1975 and she moved out while still a minor. Susanne had always craved independency, but more importantly, she really wanted to make her own money and live by her own rules. So she quickly found work as a door-to-door -door saleswoman selling magazines and newspapers. Very easy work to get by back then. And she made a decent income. And this is also where she met Mario Schwarz. Mario was originally from Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and moved to North Germany in hopes of a better life. But working as a door-to-door -door salesman was no easy feat. Long hours, unwelcoming potential clientele, all made the gig a nightmare. So he decided to get just enough money to get by and leave the job. And four weeks later, he did just that. Shortly after, Susanne followed and the two decided on a fresh start. Mario found work as a taxi driver and Susanne took a job working as a seamstress for a fashion company selling bathing suits. And all was well at first. That is until a work accident rendered Susanne unable to work. Which meant that Susanne's pregnancy came at a really inconvenient time for the couple. Their apartment was far too small for a baby and they couldn't possibly survive on Mario's income alone. But as luck would have it, Mario found a better job at a tool company, which meant yet another move, this time to Eckenthal. However, despite a promising new beginning, their happiness would be short-lived. In October 1992, just six months after Peggy was born, Susanne took off with her daughter to visit her parents in Halle. According to Mario, what was to be a short-term stay ended up turning long-term, when Susanne reconnected with her childhood sweetheart, whom she later also left for yet another man. So Peggy eventually moved to Lichtenberg with her mother, her mother's new boyfriend Ahmed, and her younger sister Yasmin. And nine years after Yasmin was born, Peggy's mom also gave birth to a baby brother called Willie, whom Peggy sadly never got to meet. Peggy herself was described as a lively, open-minded and confident kid. 
She wasn't shy when it came to strangers, but she also wasn't very trusting of them. At school, she was generally a very good student. She was known to be quite independent and a fast learner. But by the third grade, teachers, they noticed a change in Peggy. She lost all interest in school and her grades plummeted. Even her favorite subject, which was math, she just about got a pass in. She was suddenly easily distracted, even absent-minded at times. The only thing she really enjoyed at school was sports, especially football. In October 2000, she even joined a local football club, the TSV Lichtenberg, and trained regularly. Around this time, Peggy's mother also noticed that Peggy wasn't as motivated as she used to be, so she took her to a GP. He first prescribed her a natural remedy, but when that didn't help, he eventually prescribed her a psychotropic drug. So Peggy, with two working parents, would spend a lot of her time with different babysitters depending on who was available. And in addition to being looked after by a third party, Peggy would also frequently hang out by herself at various restaurants in town. Bear in mind, she was nine years old at this time. One of the places she'd frequent was a tavern called Zur Goldenen Sonne, which was visited by a questionable clientele, if you will. And Peggy would go there and just sit there for hours doing her homework. Her mother, local said, didn't seem to care. But Susanne said that she'd never felt comfortable in Lichtenberg. She never felt accepted. And very much so because her partner, she claimed, is of Turkish descent. So she said locals always had something against her. But there's more to the story. Around the time Peggy's mood began to shift, some school kids in sports reported that they saw bruises and scratches on her back. The parent of a girl who attended football training with Peggy even told officers later that she remembered Peggy crying, saying she didn't want to go home each time she was there. But Peggy herself never talked about her family situation. However, there was talk in town that she, in fact, never really got along with her stepfather. Some fellow students even told police later on that Ahmed would hit her whenever she got bad grades. Peggy would also try to avoid being left alone with him, and she'd never want to be in his presence without her mother. When Susanne later spoke to police on May 11th, 2001, she wasn't much help, unfortunately. She said that Ahmed would never hurt her child, mainly because she was the dominant one in the relationship, which is so unhealthy, that's an unhealthy dynamic. Susanne also claimed that had Ahmed actually hurt her kid, that Peggy would have told her anyway. And really, that's not true. Children can hide whole mountains from their parents, especially if they're scared to worry them. And two months after her initial statement, Susanne said that Ahmed did in fact hurt her kid and that she actually saw him hit Peggy on the arm and the face and she didn't do anything. She also said that she knew for a fact that Peggy was scared for her life whenever she was around Ahmed and she was absolutely petrified of being left home alone with him. Peggy's friend also remembered the bruises on her arms and how Peggy didn't want to talk about them. Sonia also said that Peggy's home was basically a mess all the time. And instead of getting a proper meal on her lunch break, Peggy would be fed whipped waffles, which is a sweet in Germany, not a meal. Peggy's favorite meal, in fact, was pasta with red sauce, and one of the babysitters would make this for her. Sonia further said that Peggy loved going to Halle to visit her mother's ex-boyfriend and childhood sweetheart, Vanna. Peggy actually came to see Vanna as her ideal dad. He was someone who took her to the zoo and appeared to have his life together. Tragedy was strike on May the 7th, 2001. Peggy, she just left for school like any other day and her mom was at work. Susanne was working shifts at a local senior home and very often she would not make it home in time to welcome her daughter. So Peggy had a key to let herself in after school. On May the 7th, Peggy was seen around 50 meters or 164 feet from her home, which was located at the Marktplatz, pretty much the heart of the town. At around 1.15 p.m., Peggy was chatting to her friend Miriam, 
and the two were spotted by the latter's sister Manuela, who was in her kitchen and just happened to look out of the window. Doris, mom of one of the school kids, also saw the girls chatting and waved at them, and Peggy waved back. Between 1.15 and 1.30 p.m., yet another classmate called Claudia saw Peggy, this time alone, walking briskly along Nailae Strasse. Peggy walked in front of Claudia, who recognized her by her blonde hair and her pink backpack that had a grey stuffed animal hanging from it. Peggy walked around the Henri Mardot Platz, past the Raiffeisen Bank and then towards the Marktplatz. She also turned around once, confirming her identity. Another schoolgirl called Hilke then also saw her there and remembered that she wore a jacket and olive green trousers. Local bus driver Vanne then confirmed that the bus, which presumably Hilke took, arrived at the Henri Mardot Platz at half past one. So he essentially confirmed Hilke's sighting of Peggy. But whether Peggy ever made it to her home at Marktplatz number 8 is uncertain. When her mother arrived home at 7.45 p.m., the apartment was locked, with every room shrouded in darkness. Susanne also couldn't spot her daughter's backpack, which she'd immediately drop in the hallway when arriving home. But that day, it wasn't there. However, Susanne wasn't initially worried. As previously mentioned, Peggy was very independent. She was very much a latchkey child. So next to her, next to Susanne's flat, lived the Kaisers. They were her friends, a couple, that would often agree to watch Peggy and her sister Yasmin. That day, she had also asked them to watch Peggy and her then three-year-old sister Yasmin until she gets home from work. When the door opened... Yasmin ran into her mother's arms, and Susanne chatted with her friend for a bit before inquiring about Peggy. But Elke, the friend, said that she hadn't seen her eldest all day. Susanne then took Yasmin back home and began to ring Peggy's schoolmates one by one, but nobody had seen or heard from her since 1.30 p.m. Miriam then told Susanne that she had actually walked with Peggy for a while before parting ways after which Susanne called several restaurants, but they too hadn't seen her daughter that day. At 9.30 p.m., now worried out of her mind, Susanne asked Elke to watch Yasmin again so that she can drive around town and look for her daughter. And she does just that until 9.56 p.m., when she calls the local police station and informs them of her daughter's disappearance. At 10.15 p.m. she then makes another call, this time to Ahmed, who was working at a nearby textile factory. He immediately left work to help her search for Peggy, and only left the apartment briefly to go buy a flashlight for the search, as it was dark by now. At 11.45 p.m. the local police station got in touch with the criminal police department and officers were sent out at 0.45 a.m. to begin searching for Peggy. Which, unlike in many other cases, perhaps because this did concern a nine-year-old, was rather quick, and thank God for that. Police searched the local amusement park, ponds, school, and all along the way they thought Peggy had walked that day. At 1.15 a.m., with no signs of her, police went round Miriam's home. Her mother got her out of bed quickly, and she briefly spoke to the officers who wondered whether Peggy had perhaps mentioned anything, where she was going, or maybe if she was upset about something. Miriam then told the officers exactly where the two had walked, and she also said that Peggy had told her she was going to bring Barbie dolls to school the next day. Police then told Miriam that they would be back the next day when she's had a good night's sleep, as she was visibly shaken, I mean she was just a child, woken up in the middle of the night. And as they were leaving the house, her mom ran up to them and said randomly that her daughter was actually not allowed to talk to Peggy anymore, and she was aware of that, but did it anyway. And the reason for that was that her mom believed that Peggy had a sort of habit of wandering off, and she didn't want her own daughter to hang around at restaurants just randomly. At 1.32 a.m., officers then sent out a description of Peggy to Interpol. 
Peggy was 134 centimeters in height, slim, had dark blonde shoulder length straight hair, and was wearing olive green trousers, an orange hunchback of Notre Dame sweatshirt, trainers with a bit of a heel, and a wind jacket with a yellow TSV Lichtenberg sticker on it. 45 minutes later, police were on their way to Susanne's apartment. Upon their arrival, she was composed and remarked that Peggy's backpack and her laptop were missing. She also said that her pillow, despite the messy room, appeared untouched. Susanne then also told officers that she was really unhappy about the fact that Elke didn't tell her her daughter hadn't come home sooner. That night, police knocked on several doors, not just in Lichtenberg, but also in Schwarzenbach am Wald, which is a 15-minute drive from Lichtenberg and is also where Peggy's grandparents lived. Officers searched the grandparents' house, basement, garden, but found nothing. Around 3 a.m., officers then drove to Heroldsberg to wake Mario, her dad, and he was surprised to hear of his daughter's disappearance. He told officers that he actually hadn't seen his daughter in years, and they were satisfied with his answer and left, without looking inside his home. Around that time, Ahmed also began printing out missing persons leaflets to distribute them across town. And at 5.49 a.m., the initial search came to a halt. The next day, on May the 8th, police would update what they had on the case every single hour, and they began to suspect that this was indeed a kidnapping. That morning, they sent out a large search party, which included divers to look for Peggy all over town. They searched forests, lakes, ponds, underground tunnels, even the dark corridors beneath the castle, and found nothing. As the day progressed, they extended their search all the way to the German-Czech border. But the day went by without any trace of Peggy. As officers searched, Mario and his wife Ines arrived in Lichtenberg to help in the search. He told officers that just a week prior, he had managed to find out his daughter's home address, with the help of public servants. He said that Susanne had withheld that information from him all this time. Susanne herself said that Mario actually never wanted to pay child support, to the point of the court having to intervene. But Mario, as expected, said that that wasn't true. He actually did send his daughter both money and gifts. But when those arrived and Susanne just kept taking the money without allowing him to see his daughter, she wouldn't even give him the address. He said that he just stopped paying because he, it just didn't seem fair to him. In the next few days, police focused on Peggy's inner circle and reconstructed her last day. They found out that Peggy had left her home at 8.30 a.m., dropped by a local shop, and made it to school just in time. They knew for certain that she finished her morning classes and made it to the Marteauplatz. So her journey from 8.30 a.m., to around 1.30 a.m. is certain, but everything that came after is a blur. At 2 p.m., a man called Gustav claimed to have seen a girl in his rearview mirror climb into a car. The girl was wearing a coat and the two briefly locked eyes, so Gustav was 100% sure that this girl was Peggy. Between 2.45 and 3 p.m., two classmates of Peggy's also saw her at a bakery at Machtoplatz. She then allegedly climbed into a red Mercedes, and inside that car was another girl that the two didn't recognize. They said that Peggy had her scooter with her and climbed into the back of the car from the front seat. At 3 p.m., another classmate of hers, Peter, was busy doing his homework when he looked outside the window and saw Peggy. He claimed that she was in the company of a smaller girl walking along the Quellensteinweg. This boy had been in her class since the first grade, so he knew her well. In fact, just two months later, in July 2001, he was asked to repeat his story. Peter repeated the exact same story, even remembering the backpack she wore, which was important. But a year later, when Peter is questioned again, he claimed that she didn't in fact wear a backpack and that she was alone. But at this point, 
His mother chimed in and confirmed his first statement, saying she too had seen Peggy with the smaller girl. However, she couldn't describe this unknown girl anymore. Between 4 and 4.30, Jürgen was also at the Marteauplatz, just crossing the road when he saw Peggy at the bakery. Again, she was in the presence of a smaller, younger girl. Jürgen even had a brief chat with Peggy as she left the bakery before he took off. He couldn't say whether she went back to the bakery or went elsewhere. Around that time, a classmate of Peggy's also placed her at the bakery. He said that she was looking for a drink and that next to her was a girl with long dark brown hair. Between 4 and 5 p.m., a boy named Felix said that he had been playing outside with Peggy and his older brother Marcus confirmed seeing the two. Felix was said to be saddened by the fact that nobody believed his account. And just after 4 p.m., a couple who was vacationing in Lichtenberg also saw a girl resembling Peggy. They said that they had been hiking near the Moldai restaurant when the girl appeared out of nowhere. They said it was really foggy, but they could see she had a backpack on. They also spotted a red car turning on a nearby road. The couple also said that they saw a bright logo on the back of the girl's coat, which police thought was a little bit weird considering she had a backpack on. They also made no mention of the scooter. Later in the day at 7 p.m., a boy called Pascal said that he also saw Peggy passing by his house. He clearly recognized her face and said that she was wearing a grey and red jacket. However, other witnesses claimed that she wore a black jacket and an orange sweatshirt, but this might have been due to the gloomy weather. Pascal also said that she was in fact pushing her blue and silver scooter alongside her on Karlsgrüne Weg. However, a few months later, he could no longer say for certain that the girl was Peggy. Sometime after 7 p.m., a boy named Franz was walking home from his football training and he too said that he saw Peggy walk towards Zeitelweid, the same direction Pascal gave. They both also lived on Falkenweg and Franz knew Peggy from training. Franz also saw Peggy with her blue and silver scooter wearing a grey and red jacket. A further man, called Martin Müller, claimed to have seen a Mediterranean-looking woman with a girl walking towards his workshop, located near the castle. Martin was a carpenter and said that the woman had looked confused, as if she was looking to find the main road. Police later searched the area with detection dogs and managed to pick up a scent. The grass too showed clear signs of having been walked on. But nothing came of this lead and authorities said the description did match Peggy. From all of this, authorities gathered that Peggy was in the area until at least 7 p.m. But soon, they'd receive leads that would take them outside of Lichtenberg. On May the 10th, three days after Peggy's disappearance, in a town some 20 kilometers from Lichtenberg, called Helmbrechts, a man was out on his daily walk. That is when he saw a body of a girl laying on the grass with a doll-like looking face. Next to her, on the ground, were her clothes and a bag. So this man was so shaken to have found what he believed was the lifeless body of Peggy that he just left her there, or the body, ran home and told his daughter to call the cops because he himself, he just couldn't do it. He was that nervous and just scared. So this man Dirk then met police at that same spot. But the girl was no longer there. Not her, not her clothes or bag. All they found were old tire tracks, but Dirk, who said he saw no blood on the body, swore he saw someone laying there. In the first two months after Peggy's disappearance, authorities received over 2,500 leads and 75 investigators were on the case. They spoke to witnesses, family members and searched various places and properties for her. Overall, They'd follow a total of 4,800 leads in her case, without an inkling of an idea as to her whereabouts. They even went as far as Turkey, where Ahmed is from, but again, there was no sign of Peggy. In the meantime, Peggy's case was gaining traction in Germany. She was talked about on the radio and on television, and authorities had a suspect in mind. Ulvi Kulac was the son of a Lichtenberger restaurant owner 
and he had suffered severe mental damage from meningitis as a young boy. This of course had a huge impact on his development. His mental age was estimated to be that of an 8 to 10 year old boy, with an IQ of 68. When police first interrogated him, Ulvi's mother initially provided him with an alibi. But Ulvi then came out and admitted to the offense. He said he did indeed sexually molest Peggy. In September of 2001, Ulvi was then admitted to the psychiatric department of the Bayreuth District Hospital for the sexual abuse of multiple children. He would offer these young kids cookies and ask them to play doctor with him. Despite this, in January, authorities just dropped him from the suspect list and said that his mom's alibi for him actually made sense to them, so they wouldn't pursue him any further. And perhaps it is important to note that when he abused a young boy in the summer of 2000, it was his mother who told police. So it seems unlikely for her to invent an alibi this time, as she clearly isn't okay with her son's crimes. By February, Peggy's case had become dormant and a new team was brought in. This team decided to look at Ulvi more closely. They examined his clothing in March, but that came back inconclusive. They then also bugged Ulvi's home phone and listened in into a few calls made to his father. In them, Ulvi incriminated his father by talking about how he helped him get rid of Peggy's body. So when October came, not only was Ulvi arrested, but so was his dad. When Ulvi was arrested, he told authorities how he abused the girl on May the 3rd in his apartment. On May the 7th, he then watched Peggy on her way home in order to apologize, but Peggy understandably ran off. She also allegedly threatened to tell on him. Ulvi then managed to catch up with her at Lichtenberger Schlossplatz, knocked her down while she screamed, and closed her mouth and nose until she suffocated. The process against Ulvi began on September the 30th, 2003, and on April the 30th, 2004, he was sentenced to life behind bars. And that seemed to be it for this case. Except it wasn't. In 2012, a lead witness who had been at the same facility as Ulvi took back his statement, and that led the court to review the case and Ulvi's attorney filed a motion to retrial in April 2013, which was accepted. So in April the following year, the retrial began, and shockingly, in July 2015, Ulvi was pronounced a free man. The court did order him to live in an assistant living facility, but essentially, he was free. So remember, authorities thought that they had the perpetrator as early as 2002, so for around 10 years, nothing was done to actually find the real perpetrator, which means that in the early investigation, precious time was lost. Now, police did briefly look at a man by the name of Robert in 2007. He was a known sex offender and lived in the area. But when they went through his stuff, they couldn't find any DNA of Peggy's. In 2013, they also questioned another sexual offender who had frequently visited the Knobloch household. He was said to have behaved inappropriately in front of Peggy and was temporarily arrested but let go again. Honestly, this poor girl. They also briefly looked at this man's adopted brother and thought maybe he helped him get rid of the body, but that too led nowhere. In January of 2014, Police were also alerted to an incident at the cemetery in Lichtenberg. Someone had come across an open grave, and they went to check whether that grave could entail any child bones, but no child bones were found. Then, in April 2015, divers searched the local water dam for Peggy's backpack, as it had been seen there last, but no new clues surfaced, and everything fell silent until July the 2nd, 2016. That day, a mushroom picker discovered skeletal parts in a forest near Rodachebrunn in Thuringia, about 12 kilometers from Peggy's apartment. It was believed that they had been dug up by wild animals. The bone fragments were sent off to a lab and were sadly confirmed to be the remains of Peggy Knobloch. 
the remains that were found were not complete, and authorities also could not locate any clothing, backpack or her scooter. They also could not say how long the body was there for, or how long Peggy lived before her murder. Upon further examining the remains for evidence, it was found that there were DNA traces of a male suspect on her body. And that man was right-wing terrorist Uwe Bernhard, who was in a neo-Nazi cell accused of murdering 10 people. While this was huge news and seemed promising at first, it was found that both Peggy and Uwe's bodies had been examined at the same lab. And unfortunately, it was found that the DNA was in fact transferred there through police equipment, and that Uwe had nothing to do with Peggy's murder. With nothing else to go on, the case went quiet once more, until September 2018, when police searched two properties owned by a Manuel S. He was a friend of Uwe's and was mentioned by him several times to police. It was alleged that as early as 2001, Manuel had been talking about Peggy's case. While drunk, he recounted how he removed her body, which he was handed by a man he knew by name, and buried it where Peggy's remains were later found. He also said that he tried to revive the child, and when dad failed, he destroyed the girl's jacket and bag a few days later. Manuel was finally arrested on December the 11th, 2018, but let go only two weeks later. And with that, the last lead authorities had proved unsuccessful. On October the 22nd, 2020, the responsible prosecutor announced that the investigations into Peggy's case had been discontinued and that her case had been closed. Peggy's father spoke out and he said he was devastated that Peggy has just become one of the other cold cases. And this just destroyed two families, the family of Peggy, but also the family of Ulvi, who obviously needed help. He was imprisoned for a while for something he didn't do without getting any help for his mental state. And I'm not saying what he did is okay, because it's not. He should be punished for that. But it still punished his family too. And then there's the town of Lichtenberg, who is now seen as this child sexual predator town, with several of them loose, because several of them were interviewed. And her killer has still not been found. So this is a very scary situation to be in. And sadly, this is all there is to this case. Unfortunately, since last year, there hasn't been an update. So since it was shelved pretty much, but there's always hope that the killer will be found or hopefully is in prison for something else. It's just scary to think he might be out there. And yeah, thank you very much for watching today and for listening in. I hope you liked it. If you did, please like and subscribe. Um, let me know what you think of the new format. Do you prefer me not being here or would you like me to be here more and narrate more in person? So yeah, thank you very much for watching again and for subscribing and see you on the next one. Bye bye.